So first of all, um, what is a watershed? So if you think of a drop of water that falls on any location within Minnesota, um, it just explains where it would flow and where it would and where it would leave. So a land area that channels rainfall and snow melt, um, where water flows, drains, and ultimately is discharged to basins. It's influenced by topography, which are physical features of an area, and geology, which is a physical structure and how the area was formed um, that can contain soils and other qualities that describe an area. Um, and so Minnesota has, I believe, 81 watersheds you can see here. And these colors are distinguished by basins. The basins that we're in along here all flow to uh, Lake Superior and then eventually to the Great Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean. Up here, we also have the Rainy River headwaters within our counties and all of these in yellow will flow to the Red River and then eventually to Hudson Bay. And so everything is connected. And so you can take a watershed and subdivide it into sub watersheds. But um, this is just gives you an idea of how our state is compiled and what watersheds are. As I mentioned, uh, there's two basins within the Lake and Cook areas. We have the Rainy River headwaters up here that flows to the Red River to the Hudson Bay. That's this dividing line here. Cook County also has watersheds of Lake Superior North, which is extends to a little bit above Silver Bay, so the Baptism River area. And then Lake Superior South is this watershed here that drains from that boundary to the Duluth urban area. And then we have the Cloquet within Lake County and um, the St. Louis River has a small portion and that is also on the Lake Superior Basin. And so as you can see, there's two basins within this region. We have five watersheds. And then to make it even more complex, planning areas where watersheds were lumped together for planning purposes. And we'll talk about those water plans. We have um, the Rainy River Headwater Vermilion River, one watershed, one plan. And like I said, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's a water planning process to develop goals and strategies for water pollution and other resource concerns. This one is in the planning phase and uh, there was one public meeting that has been undertaken and there'll be more along the way for you to have input if you have any input on water bodies or concerns within that region. The Lake Superior North extends from the um, Knife River up until all the way to Grand Portage. That one is the one that Elena and I collaboratively um, organized and kind of manage as water planners for this for the counties. Um, and then the St. Louis River watershed was just on public notice and that included the cloquet. I'll go a little bit more into all of that. And I don't wanna to get too wrapped in the depths, but I just wanted to let you know that there is a planning process and all of these are goals within our areas. Um, there's a watershed assessment and restoration strategy that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency does. Each of those watersheds that I showed you have a 10-year cycle of watershed monitoring where they assess the water quality conditions, biological fish and inverts. They determine if there's stressors. They see if there's any impairments um, and even identify where those high quality areas are existing. And so that data that's collected in this assessment report is one of the many things that are plugged into the One Watershed, One Plan. So these planning documents, the One Watershed, One Plan, is that previously water plans were developed by each county and soil water conservation district within those county boundaries. It didn't, it just stopped at a county boundary. It didn't talk about how water flows and interacts or soil or different things like that, how they all interact, because we know that water flows and things don't stop at a county line. Um, so the concept was that we would do it on a watershed scale. And so those watershed plans are developed by public and stakeholder inputs. They look at that data from the RAPS report that I just mentioned. They look at everybody, they bring people to the table, say, what are your goals? Where are your concerns? What are, um, some areas that you want to protect, and also where are some areas that need some work. And then those local guides 
um, bring everyone to the table to make decisions and prioritize to benefit both soil and water quality. And then funding is allocated to these projects. And then we were one of the first um, to adopt this style in 2017, where we were a pilot project. And believe it or not, we're at our five year mark. And so we'll have to go through a review process. And you are all invited to have um, participation and input on that five year review to just see where we've at, where we've been, where we want to go, what's been done, and what the concerns are within that watershed. And just giving you an idea of this is what the document looks like. It's on Lake County Soil Water Conservation District's website. Like I mentioned, it's the Knife River to Grand Portage. There's areas that are prioritized and those were based on input and also if there are areas of protection as well as if there's um, impaired waters. For instance, the Knife River is impaired for turbidity, too much sediment, um, the Beaver River is as well. And so we prioritize based on tiers. Tier one is more um, a higher priority than others. And then there's resource concerns, you know, 19 of them. I won't go into them, but stormwater is one of those. And so that's why we're covering it today. It's an important thing that we'll talk about. And then within that plan, there are goals and measurable outcomes for each of those resource concerns. And just to make sure that we're on track, that we can quantify what we've been doing um, and yeah, just make plans for future years to make goals. As you likely know, the Lake Superior North Watershed um, resource area description is one of the highest quality natural resources in the state. We're all proud to live here and um, recreate here. And so it's just a wonderful place to be. It's predominant heavy clay soils um, are susceptible to erosion. So that is one concern and one thing to consider. Um, there are strong topographic features along the shore, um, deep plunge areas, also bedrock, those clay soils that I mentioned, all of those things come into play into the water quality that we have in this area. Um, private land development is focused around specific areas. As we know, um, the Lake Superior shoreline is pretty heavily um, developed. The Two Har Harbors area, Silver Bay area, Knife and Stewart Rivers, um, Gunflint Trail Lakes, and the Grand Marais area, those all could be areas that we focus for stormwater um, BMPs or best management practices areas that we want to protect because they're developed and what we can do to keep them pristine and healthy. And as you know, there's many, many lakes and rivers within this watershed as well. So once again, we know that the water quality in this watershed along the basin, the Lake Superior North watershed is good in the area. People drink from the lakes. There's actually a lot of people that receive their drinking water from the lakes. So it's important to keep that drinking water clean. People, for many reasons, recreate on the lakes and enjoy that. Lakes and rivers are an entire ecosystem. And so it's all connected and it's bigger than just us. It's connected by many different factors. Surface waters are impacted by rain, snow melt and development. So it's impacted by stormwater. So moving on to small scale stormwater management, um, as I mentioned, those watersheds are all connected and they drain and flow to a specific area. So if you think of a drop of water or stormwater as it's moving through a system, it will pick up pollutants as it's flowing through. That could be something invisible, such as dissolved phosphorus, could be salt that you put on your sidewalk or from the roads, um, which is toxic to um, aquatic organisms or bacteria, which is dangerous for um, human contact and for gastrointestinal problems and things like that. And then phosphorus will create algae blooms and whatnot. Um, stormwater best management practices protect water quality and quantity, as you know, um, heavy rains. If we can prevent that from flooding an area and get that stormwater to just drain and filter through the soil, that's better for everybody as well. Um, low impact development strategies, 
So if you develop an area, keeping a lot of it natural, getting some practices that use natural processes to filter out that stormwater, to evapotranspiration so that plants can use it, or we can actually use it through, as you know, storm water barrels and other uses of stormwater to keep it in place and make a use for it. Green infrastructure is used by plants and other green living types of um, things that will filter and absorb stormwater by focusing on reducing that runoff and improving water quality and habitat. And that will help maintain the natural hydro hydrogeologic cycle of an area. And then one more slide and then I'll kick it off to Elena. Um, examples of pollutants that water quality can be removed, pet waste, um, dog doo-doo, make sure that you clean that up yourself on your own um, properties and as you take a walk. Um, other pet waste, you know, we have a lot of deer in two harbors, Canada, Canada geese along our parks, seagulls, all of those do have factors in um, nutrient loading and also bacteria concerns that can run off into the water bodies that we recreate in. Um, road and sidewalk salt, as I said, is toxic to living organisms. And so small amounts do a lot of harm. So we just need to make sure and be really mindful of how much salt we're using. Um, there are salt trainings that you can take, but it's just really important to use a shovel as soon as you can to remove that snow before it turns to ice so that you don't need to use the salt as much. Um, fertilizers, making sure that if you do use fertilizers, that you use them really spar spar sparingly and make sure that only the amount that you need, preferably not using fertilizers, just letting the natural um, system take place and let things grow naturally. Because as you know, fertilizers will run off and then it creates blooms of algae. Soil erosion is also, if the water is flowing and it doesn't have vegetation to keep it intact, then it will carry that sediment along with it and deposit into water bodies. Gravel and sand is the same. Um, vehicle fuel and fluids, as you've seen, there's sheens of rainbows that you can see drippages of oils and gases. So you don't want that going with stormwater as well. Household chemicals, paints, cleaners, other things, just try to keep it really natural to eliminate the chemicals that are traveling with that stormwater and even organic debris, leaves, trees, needles, grass clipping, plants like that um, can decay and also create a lot of algae blooms and excess nutrients into a water system. <laughs> now it's acting up again. <laughs> Give me a minute. There you go. So Tara, I'll just let you know um, when to flip slides. So, uh, so there's, uh, as Tara mentioned, you know, benefits of this is water quality and water quantity. So we're going to just explore a few different options. Um, I'm not going to go super in depth, but I can ask, answer questions. Um, it's kind of a high level picture and just um, ideas for folks to think about. We're so forest, forested in this area that, you know, we have, and we have such no soils and different terrain. It makes things tricky, but both of our offices have experience in a lot of these different practices, and so we can um, help with them. And a lot of these pictures are from projects that we've done within our district. So we'll talk about some rain barrels, um, permeable pavements, bioretention areas, vegetative filter strips, riparian buffers, and some bioswales. So let's dig into each one. All right. So the first one is a rain barrel. If you're not familiar with them, they can come in different shapes, different sizes. Um, they can look different, but the main thing is, is to collect rainwater off of your roof because um, if you go, you know, some of the businesses, I'm from Grand Marais, if they have a lot of rain coming down, you can see that water just shooting out the spouts. And if you're at your house, you can just see it shooting. And a lot of times we'll go to site visits and the first thing we do is turn around and look and the house has no gutters. And you can see the drip line and then the water just where it's causing erosion issues. So we really encourage gutters downspouts and if possible a rain barrow, some way to get that water moving away from especially shoreline areas with with bluffs um, away from that area. So rain barrels can offer a solution to that. They can be used for water can be used for washing your car, water in your garden, 
we don't recommend drinking from rain barrels unless you've got some sort of filter system and you're working with a cistern expert. Um, and we often like to remind people not to forget to, to take the drain and drain it in the um, fall. So they're pretty simple. You can have one, you can have two. If you need to overflow, there's a lot of things you can learn about how to even move it down into systems in the ground. Um, so they can be really beneficial. Again, their conservation benefits are to reduce the amount of water flowing on your property, to conserve water and reduce potential erosion paths on your property. Currently, Lake and Cook Soil and Water, we collaborated to have a sale right now. So if you're interested in purchasing a rain barrel or even a compost bin, um, reach out to us or you can go to the website on this form here and purchase a rain barrel. It, this is a discounted price from what you might find at Home Depot or somewhere else. And we've sold them before and people have really enjoyed them. I personally have a rain barrel and I love it. Um, and I don't even have it hooked up to my roof. I just stick it out in the wild and let the rain fill it up. So rain barrel is a really easy method just to control stormwater on your property. Next, great. So permeable pavements. We get this question a lot, you know, you know, what's some options for maybe a sidewalk if you want something nicer than just that path? Um, what permeable pavements do, you know, there's different ones and different things to think about, but they create a porous surface so that water can filter down through the soil and if you're lucky into groundwater. Um, it can be used for sidewalks, for walkways, for driveways. Um, but what we have found up in our northern climate is that you really need to talk to an expert before you put these in. Um, due to our ice and our sand and salting, it may clog up those pores so that you're not having that benefit of the water filtering through. Or if you have somebody who's maybe shoveling um, your walkway with a four-wheeler, that might just start as it frost heaves and you're starting to get your pavement like this, it can take out chunks of your, your sidewalk. So not that we're discouraging it, um, but it's an option, but we really encourage people to really think about how you're going to use these and um, what the benefits are. Another example would be is that we had a business um, that we know in the area that had a plastic underneath, and then they were supposed to use this pea gravel that was going to fill it in and create the same sort of effect, and then the water would drain into this rain garden. What they found is that the plows just continually pulled everything up and then started hitting the plastic and, and scratching the plastic. So they had to pull everything out and redo their top, their surface. So again, just things to think about if you're gonna do a permeable pavement for our climate is, can, is, it, is it feasible? And is it maybe, is there a better option that you might be able to do for a pathway? Um, and the benefits of these, you know, they reduce that overland water flow, which is nice and they filtrate water in the soils and it can recharge your groundwater. The next one is one that a lot of folks are uh, familiar with, and that's the bioretention or rain gardens or a vegetated area. Um, you can't put these in everywhere. You know, people think we can just pop them up here, pop them up there, but uh, it's not, that doesn't work that way. What you need to do is you need to look at the size of the area and look at the drainage. And then you look and see kind of often you'll see there's like a lower area or shallower area where the water tends to go. That's where we're gonna recommend where to put the rain garden. You're not gonna put it up high or somewhere where the water isn't naturally going because obviously there's not an issue there. So you'll look at your landscape and figure out where is that lower spot? Where can the water be treated? Um, it's, there's a lot of resources for it and we're gonna show a video here kind of explaining it and looking at some of them in Grand Marais. Um, but they're really beneficial. They store a lot of water. The picture on the left is across from the Grand Marais Library. That was one that we had done and it's huge. This is what it looks like before, if you see it now, before what it looks like now, just pretty bare. It's, they've got soils. This one was engineered. They're not, don't all have to be engineered, but this one was engineered. At the front of it, you can see the picture on the right. That's a different rain garden in town. Has what's called a rain guardian. So they can just pick up the grate and clean it up. Um, again, these are fancy. Not all of them are this fancy. Some of them just have a pipe that comes through off of a house um, and they're connected often to a house. And instead of having maybe a rain barrel, you just might have it drain into that low area and it just has the water and then it filters through. They aren't meant to be a pond. They're meant to be dry certain times of the year. And they're meant to store a little bit of water to treat it, let those plants pull up that nutrients. And then um, that helps to have that nutrients so they're not entering into surface water. 
Um, so Tara, if you could click on the video, we're going to have a video that our district did just kind of explaining rain gardens. So you don't have to listen to us talk the whole time and um, it should hopefully work. If not, we might have to cut and paste it. And hopefully the sound will work. That's the tricky part. Is it bringing up the video or is it still yeah. on? Okay. Well, this is the front of our house um, on Brandon Lane above Grand Marais. That's our rain garden. That's our rain garden. It was uh, designed to catch the sediment that comes off of the road and off of our driveway and filter out the sediment and let the water travel on down to the Fall River. A rain garden is a garden that is collecting rainwater and it's treating it for nutrients. So the nutrients aren't getting into nearby water bodies. And so it's collecting those nutrients and it's storing there and the plants are using them for food. And so that's a really important um, to keep those nutrients out of the water because our water up here and our lakes are actually nutrient low. And so by increasing the nutrients unnaturally that are in there, then that can create um, issues within the lake or the stream. They also are helping to collect sediment. And so those are the main functions. Any place we can catch the sediment and let it settle into the earth again, that, that's an improvement for the big lake. I asked the soil and water for plants native to Northern Minnesota, because I think for me, that's gonna be low care. They're gonna thrive here. They're ready to go in this area. We were also interested in uh, increasing the diversity for native pollinators. And the native species can look beautiful, as you can see. It's important because you don't want to introduce exotic species into the area. With having exotic species, species that don't grow in the area, you can change um, the ecosystem because the native species have to fight a lot harder than to grow. It, it's really uh, starting to fill in. The plants that were planted are coming into their third season. And our soil and water district gave us a huge amount of help and made it just pain-free. And they tailored it to what we wanted. They did everything. We're really happy with ours. We love it. For me personally, it is my artistic expression. Certainly one of my purposes for being on the planet is tending this beautiful corner that is public. We are on 2nd Avenue and 1st Street, kitty corner from the library and adjacent to Highway 61. And I'm looking at Lake Superior, the harbor is right there. Coming down the hill when there's a storm, all the oil and silt and sand and weed seeds off roofs come pouring down the street here. It's important because we have pristine waters and we want to try to keep them clean. It's a one different way that's natural to be able to treat storm water. We feel it's important because, yeah, we want to keep our waters clean and keep them protected instead of being, having to come back later and restore them. If I were to spend a couple of hours out here and it's a busy day, at least a dozen people. And it's fun. I chit chat and they say it's beautiful. <laughs> You have a beautiful garden and I say thank you. We are in downtown Grand Ray. This is kind of city center. Behind me here in this blue building is the library. There's three buildings here that have roofs kind of concentrating flow into the area between the two buildings, this alleyway. And so the rain garden is going to collect that water and infiltrate it and hold the water so it doesn't all discharge into the rivers and lakes all at once. So it's a, a way to infiltrate a lot of water uh, over a delayed period of time and to also kind of purify the water, give it some time to soak into the plants. The plants uptake some of the pollutants and also break down some of those contaminants that may be in water or coming off the streets. There's a couple of different zones or a few different zones to a rain garden. Um, this one's receiving water between the buildings and so this pipe constant brings a concentrated flow to this particular portion of the rain garden. So the bottom of the rain garden is going to be the wettest and the edges are going to be have a little more drier soil on average. So we planted accordingly and use plants that can tolerate certain amounts of wetness. So we use all native plants that are neonicotinoid free. So it's got to be friendly to the bees that are struggling right now. We need to have the right soil mixture. So here we have a, a typical rain garden soil of a sand and a loam mixed together. And that creates a, a nice water holding capacity for the plants to hold and also an infiltration rate for the water to get back into the ground. We definitely want to make it as easy as possible for anyone who's interested in planting a rain garden. Yeah, we'll provide technical assistance. And uh, sometimes we may even have financial assistance programs that you could have all of your part of your project funded.
it's rewarding because uh, I guess I get to go back and see, um, you know, a year later, two two years later, what the uh, projects look like and how much uh, sediment they're actually gathering and uh, the stuff that's not going into our waterways. And, you know, I, I think that they do help, you know, we're, we're right next to Lake Superior. I think it helps keep the lake clean. I'm definitely excited to see this year. It's, it's going to be great publicity and uh, it's going to be a great um, addition to the town to have this rain garden kind of front and center. A lot of people pass by and they'll raise awareness for water quality and rain gardens. Hey, I know those people. That's pretty awesome. Good work on that video. <laughs> um, so thank you, Tara. So all the rain gardens, the one that Gina was in, that's what it looked like prior. And then you could see how tall it got just very quickly. Um, the rain gardens don't have to be this engineered and they don't have to be as big as you saw with Marines. That was just in front of their house. It didn't have any of these fancy rain gardens or pipes. Um, it can just be a place where you wanna take care of some storm water on your property. Um, next slide, please. So this is just an example of a benefit of a rain garden. We had a three inch rain event last year. Um, this rain garden was a year old um, and you can see how much rain came into it. This is right beside the Best Western. So it's got beach gravel and bedrock underneath it, and it's got um, rain coming off of the roof and, and rain coming from the road. There, you can see that pipe that's to help slow some of that water. Um, there's a basin there to help slow some of that water coming into this rain garden. So it was pretty amazing that in 24 hours, um, the next day, you can see the water had filtered and treated. I wish I would have had a picture the day prior to this so you could see kind of how much sediment was also in there. But you can see that they really do help with that water quantity and not just the quality. This one was an engineered one because we had bedrock issues and we were diverting um, a large hotel drainage system into it too. But again, they don't all have to be this robust and, and um, they don't have to be engineered. We do have to remember though, when you do plant me to keep in mind things like geese or other plants or, or other animals, cause they will come in um, and take over. And so we just have to watch out for invasive species and really try to keep them native if possible. Next one, Tamara. Thanks. So this is, you know, progression if you wanna do a rain garden. Again, we have bigger pictures of them just because it's more dramatic. I don't know, it's just easier to see kind of the transition, but this is down by the brewery um, in two harbors and you can see what it looks like. They have erosion control because we're on cliffs. There's a pipe, a riser pipe, two of them that will drain into another system because this one probably takes on an enormous amount of water. So it's not, you can't just throw them in willy nilly and go quick. There is some thought process into it, but you can see what it looks like at the beginning it takes a year or two to start to get plants established. And then a few years later, you have what you have a picture on the right where you just have this robust pollinator habitat with native plants really doing a job. It's like, you don't have to fertilize it or do anything because it's collecting everything that it needs. So rain gardens are just a really easy solution to treating some storm water and, and to working with it, the natural system. And there's also what's called a vegetative filter strip. Um, just think a vegetated area that might be in the low area with that's having some erosion issues. Often these drain into a stormwater system and they're there just to treat the water and slow the water down. So here it looks like it was just an area that was just grass and probably sloppy and gross when you're walking. So there was an erosion control blanket down and then just native plants put down and then this pathway for this water to go in the stormwater drain. So there's different views or options for these um, types of bioretention areas for, for stormwater management. Just wanted to mention that this was Lake Superior Dental in Two Harbors, and um, this was a new development. So they knew that they had stormwater that was gonna be running quite a bit down that slope. And they contacted us for some resources and they were able to get um, this project cost shared. We'll talk about that funding source, but yeah, it was a really good collaborative as well. Thanks, Tara. And there, what we find is with these rain gardens and these projects, they can reduce almost like 70% of nutrients from entering into storm water or entering into waterways. They really do benefit the resources. Um, here's another example of just a rock slash vegetation strip, otherwise known as I like to call them, we call them fancy ditches or, um, you know, it just, it's doing its job, but it's not just your plain old ditch where everything's going to run through. So the picture on the left, sorry, it's dark, but there's just a lot of erosion happening. It's going into this, it's just causing issues on this road. There's a gravel road below it. You can kind of see the water's kind of going down into some weird pipe. 
landowners called us and said, hey, we need some help. Um, and so there you can see the picture in the middle um, is getting there right before we get ready to dig it. It's getting dug down. And then if you wanna hit the next slide, please. Um, you can kind of see what it looks like. So the picture from before in the middle when it was completed, and then it just kind of grows over. Again, it's a fancy ditch. It, there's a pipe there to collect the water, but it slows the water down, which is huge because then it's gonna minimize erosion and cause a lot less issues. You can, we've done these in people's property before. Um, it's just, hey, I've got issues with erosion. Can you come help me out? And we just, they're vegetated swales, we call them. Um, nothing fancy except for a fancy ditch that's just um, functioning as it should be and maybe connected to a stormwater system. The other thing we have um, is the riparian buffers. Those are huge. So riparian is an area along a lakeshore or a river. And uh, those who live on them, we can't stress the importance that they have on water quality. We don't need to watch the second video, but there is a video just on Grand Marais, um, natural buffers on Lake Superior that actually work. And there's one at East Bay and there's one at the Best Western. This is a picture of the East Bay one. So you can see what it looks like five years later. Um, but they serve a huge purpose because what buffers do, not just a little three foot where you have mowed the lawn down, but like actual robust plants that are, are native trees, things that are there that can help slow the water down. They collect the nutrients, they collect the sediment. We're finding that they help when you have a lot of ice, dam ice flow and ice dams on lakes and pushing and heaving and, and shoving. Um, they help hold the soils in place and minimize erosion. They slow that water down. And there's a lot of resources for this. The DNR has a landscaping for native plants. The soil and waters both have extensive experience with this. Um, and if you're not putting up gutters, it's also really important to have these buffers if you're on a lake or a river, because again, it just slows it down. Almost 90% of the time when we go out to site visits and there's no gutter, and it's often that the lawn has been completely mowed down with just like this much buffer. And they're so proud of, people are so proud and good job for you, but you actually need it a lot larger. And that's probably why you're seeing issues. There's just no roots. There's nothing to slow the water down. So I can't stress enough um, the importance of having riparian buffers and to have these resources here. And again, we are, both our offices are pretty well versed in putting these in and, and being able to help get these established. So. And then we have large scale stormwater management. So even though those felt big, they're actually pretty small. Um, a larger scale, and I'll pass this off to you after I'm done with this one, Tara, is just, uh, we've worked really closely with our cities. So the city of Two Harbors, Silver Bay and Grand Marais, after this year, we'll have stormwater management plans. Other little municipalities are starting to pick them up. Um, the benefits of having a stormwater management plan is it identifies an inventory, what needs to be done, where should things be, assist with erosion and flooding. It's a tool to use to prioritize and manage stormwater on a larger scale. But if you're going back to your property and you're thinking, well, what about my property though? Just think about a little plan for your property. Where's the water going? Where, where could I do here? Oh, maybe here I could just throw a rain barrel up because it's always sloppy and the grandkids are getting dirty and muddy and it's driving me nuts because this lawn's getting ripped up. Or maybe I could put a small rain garden and it doesn't have to be any big, but just plant some extra plants realizing that it's not going to be wet all the time and I might need some help. So it doesn't have to be big like this. There's options for you, um, not just not so big, just looking at your property at a smaller stormwater scale. So Tara, I'll let you take the last few then. Great. Um, and then just to point out, here's a curb cut, you know, just a way for water to drain into an area so that it doesn't have to beat over the curb and go into a storm drain, then it would go right to that rain barrel. Um, so yeah, as Elena said, we can scale this down to whatever scope you want. But yeah, just planning on your property, looking at where that drainage is, is really helpful. And I thought we would just share some of these examples of what um, areas within our um, jurisdiction and county are doing and it can we can all make a change um here is something that's unseen but it is a great uh, bmp best management practice for stormwater and this was developed from the two harbors stormwater management plan we identified where drainage is occurring where it congregates and then where it's going to be discharged to a water body um, within two harbors skunk creek is the flowage um, through river or through town and then it discharges 
to Burlington Bay. And if you didn't know, both Burlington Bay and Two Harbors, as well as Agate Bay, are impaired for bacteria. Um, they have high levels of bacteria at times, and we've done numerous studies within um, the last 10 years, and that's shown that a lot of that bacteria is from stormwater. And I think it's because, of, it's similar with Duluth, that there's such old infrastructure, whether it's leakage or whether something is just configured inappropriately under the streets, that we have bacteria commingling with um, stormwater, which is being discharged. And so one thing that we can do is this hydrodynamic separator is something that was installed underground. Um, it drains about six acres of um, land. And then before it discharges, it collects all the sediment. And another thing we found out is that a lot of time that bacteria is um, attached to sediment. And so if we can get that sediment out, that'll also assist with those bacteria levels. Um, so this is a hydrodynamic separator. It was installed in two harbors during a road reconstruction, and that's usually when we propose these because things are getting dug up already. Um, and then we'd provide a grant to just pay for the cost of this, and then everything else would be covered by, you know, the road authority because they have to do it anyways. And so these are good, simple structures, not simple, but just meaning that we can implement them as road reconstruction projects occur. Um, it's kind of the first of, um, many within this um, area. And then there's debris separating baffle boxes, which are just larger. Um, so these hydrodynamic separators treat about three to six acres. And then the debris baffle boxes are um, from like seven to 46 acres. And then it can reduce sediment between five and 9,000 pounds, if you can believe what that would look like being discharged to a water body. So there is some maintenance that's required. It would have to be pumped every couple um, times a year. And then um, the city's been man maintaining those. And once again, these are just underground connected to the stormwater pipes where it's allowing sediment to settle out be before it's discharged to a water body. Other things that large scale cities can do are sediment basins where it just allows water to slow down, settle water and while it's settling that water, it's settling the debris and the sediment that it's carrying as well and the pollutants. And you can do those just small scale on your property as well. Um, and then stormwater ponds, as we mentioned, can really counteract some of those flooding concerns, um, assist with development um, and just, you know, things that are being built, we can collect more water as it's being reflected from those impervious surfaces. Um, another project that Two Harbors is doing is biochar, which is just pretty much like charcoal, but it adheres pollutants to itself. And so we're going to have a biochar enhanced infiltration ditch. Um, as I mentioned, you can see these lines here are the stormwater um, drains that are being discharged directly to Agate Bay. What we're going to do is intercept those and daylight them, meaning like they're not going to be underground anymore. They're going to be coming to the surface of the land here. It's going to be a two stage ditch and the water just naturally flows down, you know, along this area that's not developed. And then there are um, natural ways that it's going to be settling out, being treated naturally with plants and through time of just settling out. Um, and then it'll be treated naturally. And so we're gonna be doing a phased approach, but this first phase we got awarded money from um, the federal GLRI, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to do this first phase that'll be done next summer. So when you see digging around down in Agate Bay, that's what this is. Um, the source, like I said, is bacteria. We really wanna reduce that amount of bacteria going into Lake Superior. This land is owned by DNR, so it's a collaboration of DNR allowing us to do this construction. It's the City of Two Harbors Stormwater, um, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency helped us with getting the funding, and then our office is designing and assisting with making sure and managing that this project is gonna be completed. So it's kind of exciting on a larger scale. As I mentioned, there are some funding opportunities. 
Um, we talked about those large scale grants and we assist as offices with agencies to do those implementations. However, we are focused on landowner resource concerns and we're here for, like I mentioned, consultation advice and we do have some financial resources available. Our cost share money we get from the Board of Wild Water Soil Resources. Every year we get a small pot of money that we can allocate to protection and improving of soil and water resources um, based on the project scope and the resource concern and the outcome. If it's a priority area, um, you can get 25 to 75% of the project paid by that funding and that would be through our office. Each SWCD Soil Water Conservation District has a policy that the board establishes to determine how we're going to spend this money. Um, and so it's prioritized. You know, we can't um, distribute to everything, but yeah, definitely contact us if you're interested. Also, the Board of Water Soil Resources has the Lawns to Legumes um, grant, and it's open right now. It's open until January 18th. Uh, they have a map of priority areas, and I took a look this morning, and it's pretty much everything along the coast of Lake Superior, and a lot of our counties are within those priority areas. So I'm not sure how likely you would be to be funded, um, but it would definitely, if you're interested in some native plants, which as we talked about, have those long, deep roots that will assist with habitats and bees and butterflies, as we know, are becoming endangered, um, but also it'll soak up more of that stormwater that we mentioned today. And those grants are $350. So you can apply on the Blue Thumb website and it requires a 25% match, but that match could be considered your own time for maintenance and they allow a $25 an hour match. So that's about four hours of your time just to plant them yourself or maintain it. So that'd be an easy thing to do on your own property. So just transfer some of that grassy area that you have on your property into some native plants and create some habitat, which should be great. So once again, just contact us for more information and resources. We have a wealth of information. Um, we'd love to help. So just a review of what we covered today, um, stormwater management on your property can benefit water quality. We know that it slows the water down. Um, it treats the water, it absorbs those nutrients, it holds that water in place. It also filters out that sediment. It provides habitat, as you mentioned. It reduces erosion because it allows the water to slow down and doesn't break up that sediment as much. Reduces sediment and nutrient transfers to surface waters and can recharge groundwater. Here's our contact information if you would like to get a hold of either one of us. And you can always Google our offices or write this down tonight. Um, 